Here's the beginning of the brand new Dual Pentium Pro build. Brand new Micronix motherboard right here. This was a nice find on eBay. Guy's got a couple more of these apparently. This is going to be an interesting build because I'm probably going to have to modify an ATX power supply to be able to use with this board. But we'll find out here. I'm going to do some testing on this board. But uh, this is what a brand new motherboard from 1997 looks like. Got the uh, pair of voltage regulators nicely. N nice that was supplied with this. We got our manuals here. This motherboard has onboard SCSI. So of course we've got the manuals right here for the two SCSI onboard SCSI controllers that's on this board. Adaptec. Pretty standard uh, SCSI controllers for the time. Something you'd see quite often on the second-hand market. <clears throat> and we got our manual here for the motherboard, which is a uh, decent uh, thickness uh, manual. And uh, unlike modern manuals that have five pages of gibberish talking about safety and all the certifications that a motherboard is uh, passed and then that same five pages is repeated in 15 different languages to get to a manual that thick. This one is a complete manual talking about everything and it's in English only. <laughs> the very interesting glossary on the back. This is something that you know they used to do back then. You know they give you a nice description about what all the meanings of the terms and stuff that you would see you know, CPU and disk drive and DRAM and fast SCSI, EEPROM, parallel, ROM, RAM, POST. I mean, this was this is stuff they used to give you in a manual. And it, you know, helps you learn stuff while you're doing this stuff. You know, learning about how to build computers is one thing, but learning all the terminology and what all this stuff means, that goes into learning this stuff too. So, you know, that was a lot of education that's been lost in modern motherboards uh, but uh, this even has an append uh, thing right here, this appendix of beep and post codes so apparently it must flash the post code on the um, BIOS post screen there about what part fails or maybe just runs through these codes on the screen as it's uh, booting up there I'm not sure <clears throat> got different hard drive types right here this is another thing that's handy to have especially for older computers like 386s and early 486s that you have to go into the BIOS and manually configure the the uh, cylinders and heads and stuff like that it's got a nice uh, list right here of at least the common ones anyway so if there was some that weren't in your BIOS uh, of course a lot of times the hard drive didn't that you have didn't actually fit into any of these but sometimes they did, and sometimes what they said on them didn't work, and you'd have to use one of these, and then it did work. It's really strange. Some of that older stuff's really strange. You get a whole thing in here about uh, messages and troubleshooting and stuff like that. It's a lot of stuff you just don't get nowadays with this stuff. And uh, I was reading through this manual. And the one thing that's missing from this manual is what kind of power supply this motherboard requires. And I downloaded the PDF version of this motherboard manual and it didn't have it either. It was the exact same thing as this. But I ended up finding an appendix to this manual, which is not in this one, but uh, I did find one online. And the power supply requirements for this board is rather interesting. But I'll just talk about that once I get it out of the packaging. <clears throat> so we've got our serial and parallel right here, very common for that era. Socket 7 boards and 46s uh, came with this, typically. And this is for the onboard uh, video controller, which is a Cirrus Logic chip. And it has... Uh, a spot for one meg of video expansion. That's two sockets right here for that. That's the video chip right there. And we've got our 
manual or uh, driver discs right here. That's the the uh, Cirrus Logic chip right there. It's on the motherboard. And we've got our SCSI controller, and we've also got our eISA configuration utility. Yes, this is an eISA and PCI Pentium Pro motherboard. So we've got our eISA slots right here. We've got our Adaptec chip right there. And this is the Intel 440FX chipset. So it also has eight RAM slots on it, 72 pin. EDR fast page RAM can also it also supports um, ECC. Uh, 512 meg of RAM is what this board is said to support. Though they do make 128 meg per stick EDO, 72 pin EDO. So who knows if this would actually support it? As you can see, it's never been opened. This is brand new. As I said, got all this foam padding that's glued to the box. At least the top one is anyway. I kind of, it's kind of sad to have to cut that. Maybe I'll try to peel that up or something. Oh, yeah, I think it will peel up. Let me just see here. Made in Taiwan. So let me uh, let me put the camera down. I'll get this out of the bag, and we'll continue this little unboxing of this brand new Pentium Pro motherboard. So here it is out of the bag. See the onboard SCSI there and the IDE controllers. There's our EISA slots. And we do have a battery right there which is leaking. There is some fuzz building up on it which that's unfortunate but it's to be expected even though it's brand new. It's never been used and it's uh, 20... Mm, well, it's about 20 years old now, I guess. So, I'll have to clean that up. It'll probably take a charge, but I'm going to have to clean that up. I'm going to have to replace that. Uh, I could try resealing it, maybe, but that'd be better just to replace it, probably. I hate to desolder anything on a brand new motherboard, dang it. Oh, well. I don't know why they'd use that instead of a coin battery. That's really strange because the manual has a picture of this board and it actually does show a coin battery. Well, the manual shows this and a coin battery. It depends on what image you're looking at. There's an image in there about battery disposal and it shows the coin battery on this motherboard. And it, I don't know. But, uh, yeah. We've got our nice dual Pentium Pro slots right here. Our RAM. Micronics, if you didn't know already. So what they did on this board is we have a standard AT connector, P8, P9, and this is the 5 volt and 12 volt. And we've got another one over here for the 3.3 volt. Then we've got another one over here for additional 5 volt. And then somewhere on this board, and I'm not sure where it's at right at the moment, but there's supposed to be a power plug for standby as well, and I'm not sure where it's at. I'll have to look at the manual again. What they did, according to the appendix for the power supply part of this board they forgot to include in the manual, <laughs> go figure, kind of important I would think, is that this board requires an ATX power supply, but the way they did it is they use standard AT connectors, so a power supply and they say this in there, you have to order a special power supply, an ATX power supply with standard AT headers on it, which is broken up into the 5 volt, 12 volt, 3.3, and then the additional 5 volt, and then you also have a standby, and uh, in fact that might be what this, half of this might be the 3.3 and the other half might be the standby, I'm not sure, 5 volt standby, because this does have a soft uh, power on switch on so it's it's an ATX motherboard but it's not in an ATX format nor does it use a traditional ATX power supply header it's bizarre but <clears throat> that's easy enough to modify an ATX power supply to fit this board and it said in the in the in the uh, appendix that this is just a this, it's wired it specifically says 
that the power supply when it's custom ordered is wired specifically for standard ATP8 P9 pinout. So what I'm hoping is maybe cross your fingers that it doesn't necessarily need the 3.3 volt to operate because there are AT uh, Pentium Pro motherboards out there some of them have just AT some of them have both AT and ATX so maybe just maybe this will work without having to have that 3.3 I'm gonna try it if not I'm going to make an adapter to an adapt to adapt a ATX power supply to this and actually eBay does sell one that splits down to P8, P9, and P10 to give me my 3.3. And I don't know if both, if the P10 and P11 are 3.3 or just the P10 and the P11 is the um, standby side of it. You're wondering, well, what the heck am I going to put in those EISA slots besides just an ISA sound card or something like that? Well, I found something else that's going to go absolutely perfectly in this board. And that would be this, an E-ISA Ethernet card. This is a compact card. This is what they called their NetFlex cards, which actually is kind of pointless if you really look closely at this card. But the basic idea was you buy the card, and then you could put whatever kind of networking adapter that you wanted into it. So say you wanted to have an Ethernet or a token ring or whatever else the future held they would make the card itself and then you would plug it into this board and then you wouldn't have to change the whole board the theory being that it's easier to upgrade the card and cheaper because you're not having to buy the entire card this particular module here is very familiar to me I've seen modules like this or exactly like this or very similar to this either way um, to what they put in copiers and printers to put those on the network, make those network copiers and printers. It's just to, they put a different backing plate on. Those would be in like a little plastic tray that you'd slide in to the printer. I think it's the same card. And everything else here is just the, the processor and stuff, chips necessary to interface the card to the EISA bus. But the, the flaw in this is that if you have this installed in the case, you still have to remove the card in order to remove the entire card in order to replace this module because the module is screwed into the card and so is the backing plate right here. So it's not an easy removal process, which I think is kind of a downside to this because it seems to me like you'd want to have. Uh, the card installed in the computer and then if you wanted to change the module out for a faster networking card or wireless for example I wonder if they ever made any wireless cards. Says, yes wireless for desktops did exist back in the 1990s and I'm going to show you one of those cards at some point in the future but for now this was not as easy to change out as they probably made it seem it to be because you still have to pull the card out it would have been a lot better had this actually been a module that you just pulled out without having to take the entire card out of the computer. That probably would have been the smarter way to do this. But it is what it is, and uh, this will be the first eISA Ethernet card that I've ever had, so I'll be curious to see what kind of performance this is. I do not know if it's 10 megabit or 100 megabit. My assumption is it's 10 megabit. But as I have not looked up the actual specs of this card to be sure on that, I can't really say. The Netflix, arc, the Netflix cards, the idea behind that was the same as the TriFlex architecture, or maybe even was part of the TriFlex architecture family, in that you put a, you know, the you didn't have to replace the motherboard or the RAM or anything like that in the computer when you upgraded it. You just replaced the processor card which had, in some cases, had the video card part of it. In other cases, it was just a processor board and RAM, which is uh, you just replace the whole board. And that's what this card right here is for. This is the one that I bought 
in hopes of trying to revive that Pentium 60 system, it's the same exact architecture, that Triflex architecture. You just put this whole card in, you don't re remove the motherboard, just one screw and this whole thing pops out. That was their Triflex architecture stuff that they did back then. So, in fact, that card probably went to the same system that that thing did. Very similar system anyway. So, that's what's going to be going into that baby. Assuming I can get the power supply figured out. We've got two 64 meg EDO sticks right here for a total of 128 meg of RAM. That should be plenty for now. Uh, later on I may upgrade it to 512 just so that I fill all the slots, but you know, I don't really have to. 128 is fine. And this is probably not going to be going into it, but I'll probably use this more for benchmarking and testing and stuff like that, so I don't want to put it in there into a system where it's going to be difficult to remove it, but I finally have one. A blacktop Pentium Pro. And, and it's kind of interesting. I didn't expect this on these, but the uh, black top right there is actually an aluminum cover. You can see the edge of it right there. It's an aluminum cover that wraps around that wafer there. And there's a couple pins that aren't quite as straight as they should be, but I haven't tested this chip yet. I hope it works. But, uh, yeah, I finally got myself a black top 1 meg Pentium Pro chip right there. And it's every time I see one of these things, even though I've seen them many times, and held them many times, it always still shocks me the sheer size of that processor. It's just amazing. <clears throat> just amazing how big that thing is. So, this is some of the stuff that I've got here to play with. And I've got a, that one system that I showed in the previous video uh, that has a step K6 system that has a SCSI hard drive. I think that SCSI hard drive is going to go into this Pentium Pro, but I've got some 9.1 gig drives as well. That might go in here. We'll just have to see, but well, progress is being made now on the dual Pentium Pro system build here that I'm doing. Right now I'm just running one of the processors in it, and I am running the blacktop processor, and it does run in this motherboard. I was able to work out the power supply issue. I did have to convert an ATX to an AT. I had this uh, extension cable laying around this, converted it to a, from a 20 pin to a 24 pin, so I chopped off the 24 pin end. It would have plugged into the motherboard. And uh, I found some power supplies laying around at work. Uh, this one, this is an Antec True 430. It's still a good power supply. Um, this was actually in a Pentium 3 system, Pentium 3 600 system that I acquired at work. An all original system, pretty nice little system, but uh, I snagged the power supply out. I put another power supply in the system that I had, but uh, um, this one I snagged uh, mainly because it already has a 3.3 volt uh, plug. This is one of the earlier uh, Pentium 4 era power supplies that had that 3.3 uh, volt plug on it, so I used that. It had a 5 volt wire as well, so I just snipped that. I'll probably tie that into one of the 3.3 volt wires there at some point. But this is more just for a test. And it is up and running. So I've got I've got to do, I don't think I have to do, but I'm going to do the second power connector right here. This is also 3.3, and these are wired up backwards from um, the standard AT connector where the standard AT connector, the center pins are ground and the outer pins are your power and negative. Um, this one here, the center pins are your 3.3 volt rail and the outer ones are the ground. So, um, Unfortunately, these connectors are all wired only one way, that these 3.3 volt connectors, and these were the only ones that I had. Uh, so I didn't have to buy an adapter on eBay. There is adapters on eBay to convert ATX to AT. There is also one on eBay that has a 3.3 volt 
uh, plug coming off of it. But the picture that I saw didn't make me th think that it was long enough for the connector to stretch from this side all the way over to this side. And even if somehow it possibly did, and I don't think it will, because there's probably a good, probably 10 to 12 inches here between these two, almost a foot, probably foot end to end actually, a little over a foot and possibly, but it's, it's a long stretch. I didn't feel confident that it would reach, didn't want to spend the 10 bucks for it either just in case it didn't work. So this is what I ended up doing. So I snagged uh, two power supplies, two, two plugs off of two power supplies here. And I've got a third one that I need to snip. This one down here. And uh, this power supply is bad. So it won't do any harm to snip it. i got to snip that one. This one uses gray wires for the 3.3 instead of orange wires. But it'll still work. So that's what I'm going to use. I'm going to solder that into these 3.3's coming off of the connector itself and that'll complete this side of it. And these wires, the, these terminals are all tied together so it is feeding both sides with power but I personally feel like it would be fine with the way it is right now but it wouldn't hurt. It, it, I don't know these things, I didn't think these things drew that much current but I don't think they do but uh, it's probably an overkill design but uh, it's working right now. There's also an additional 5 volt over here. And the manual says it recommends that, but it's not necessary. So one of the problems I had when I first did this was that I couldn't get the dang thing to actually um, post. And I plugged the speaker in. I, this is all the RAM that came out of that uh, CPU card right up there. And that's the first time I've used that RAM. And it's actually 256 meg of RAM total, so that's nice. Uh, I haven't tested the RAM that I bought with this yet, so that'll probably come later. I might just use that for another system, maybe, since this is 256. But um, I couldn't get the system to post, and it ended up being because of the video card. And what I'm pretty sure is going on here with that is this motherboard and probably a lot of other Pentium 2 era and later Pentium era probably. Um, this is when they started going to the 3.3 volt uh, PCI cards. And the older cards that I have, I don't, yeah, they're up here. Uh, I didn't test this one. But these older cards are older, they're all old nowadays. <laughs> but anyway, these, these older PCI cards are 5 volt cards, I think. I'm pretty sure they're 5 volt cards. And, uh, so I don't think it was getting enough power to run them. So I've got a Matrox Mystique 220 in it right now. And that car's working fine. I've also got a heatsink just stuck onto the processor right now with a cooling fan on it. This is uh, for a socket 775 actually. And uh, that's something I've got to figure out a heatsink mount for this thing. Because these Pentium Pro heatsinks for some reason people think they're worth $15, $20, $30 on eBay. And or more, and um, there's no two that are the same. So I'm gonna have to come up with something, unless I just happen to stumble across some heat sinks and fans and stuff like that. But it is working right now, so let's just flip the power switch on. And what's interesting is that even though this board is set up for uh, soft power ATX style power supply. Uh, it does have a jumper on it down here. This jumper right here switches between forced on and soft power on. So I've got it in the forced on position right now, but all that does is this header right here is for the soft power, the, the 5 volt standby and then the soft power, which would be the uh, purple and the purple and green wires on the ATX. And all that all that jumper does is it's a direct connection to the power on of the power supply and it grounds it out. That's all it does. That's, so it's the exact same thing I'm doing right here. That's a, that's all that jumper that that's literally all that jumper does is just ground that 
green wire to the black wire. That's all it does. So I don't really need that jumper on because I'm bypassing it obviously here, but I was trying to figure out if I had a power supply problem, if it required, for some odd reason, if it required 5 volt standby to engage something with the BIOS or something going on here because I couldn't get the damn thing to post, but when I saw that, I looked, saw that man, that jumper in the manual, and I said, well, this, I, and I ohmed it out with my, my test meter, and I saw that it was just doing exactly what I'm doing here. I'm like, well, the way I've got this rig should work, and then, well, it ended up being because of the video card. And what threw me off was that I wasn't getting any beeps. I wasn't getting any beeps when the memory was out. I wasn't getting any beeps when the video card was out. And I've got the video card, the onboard video jumper here set to disabled. But I don't know if it's actually 100% disabled or not. But So it might have been thinking that there was a video chip even though it's disabled. You know, when I, oops, when I, uh pulled out the video card. Either way, I didn't get any beeps. I did get a I did get a video beep once in a while if I would turn it off and then turn it back on right away. I would get a video beep. So I knew the board was alive. But anyway, it was a long, drawn out, arduous uh, <laughs> attempt to get this thing up and running. And I finally figured out that, well, it was just a video card the whole time preventing it. So, as you can see, we're booted up. And with the one make cache processor, this BIOS is only seeing 256K of it. Now, I don't have an operating system. I don't have a hard drive, anything like that. So I haven't been able to confirm yet whether or not that's actually true. It might be the BIOS is just not uh, updated far enough to recognize cache above 256K. It may only be um, enabling that much. I don't know yet. So we'll have to see when I get this system um, boot it up and actually into an operating system so I can, you know, DOS or something like that so I can actually run some tests. But uh, we can go into the BIOS setup here and it's pretty standard for that era. Pretty standard OEM Phoenix BIOS here, nothing terribly special. The only uh, performance thing you can really do on this is adjust the DRAM speed. 50, 60, or 70 and that uh, that's timings. Well, it doesn't tell you what the timings are, but that's all it is, is a timing thing. And then we've also got a multiprocessor specification, 1.1 or 1.4. And uh, that's about it as far as performance stuff goes in the BIOS. It's kind of interesting that it's got a, it's got a built-in backup reminder in the BIOS. That's kind of interesting. That would probably be pretty handy even today. Um, and I uh, disabled the floppy check that was enabled. So let's see here, the BIOS did hold overnight, so that means the battery... I left this thing on for about two hours last night so it'd get that battery charged up, and it looks like it did. So I think I'm going to just go ahead and leave that battery in there because I cleaned it up. There's nothing leaking out of it now. And I keep an eye on it, obviously, but usually these things don't leak unless they're dead. So it's charged up. And I tested it last night. It was holding about 2.6 volts of power before I left it on for two hours. So it is taking a charge. So, but I'm going to keep an eye on it. And if I have to replace it, I will. But I just don't want to put the soldering gun to a damn, you know, to a brand new motherboard. I, it seems wrong somehow. So I've got a matched pair. If you remember the uh, vintage computer mega haul videos, and one of those I showed you guys. Um, some penny, brand new Pentium Pro processors that I picked up. Well, two of those processors are were in a package together in there. They're matched processors, so that's what's going to be going in here eventually. Um, I'm not running the second processor because I want to complete um, the power feed to this motherboard just in case that ends up being too much current draw for these two two of the uh, six pins right here to handle. I can't believe this thing would draw that much current, but anyway, that's what we're at. That's where we're at right now with it. We do have our onboard IDE right here and floppy connector, and this only has one IDE channel, so it's primary only. It's either pri it's BIOS, it's primary or disabled. So since this is SCSI, that's what we're going to run this with is a SCSI hard drive, because why not? You know. And uh, we got a plethora of either uh, EI supports there. And this one is shared. 
this PCI slot it says in the manual is shared with this first EISA slot so that means it's not going to probably work with most any card I put into it so that's always a bummer <clears throat> I'll probably end up running an ISA sound card in this um, either a sound blaster or a media vision card um, and uh, the EISA Ethernet card and that's really all I need to put in this system so that's where we're at right now so I gotta find a case um, if last resort I'm gonna use this case if I can't find another I've, if the other case I'm planning on using doesn't work but I would have to pull that massive power supply out of that case and figure out a way to mount this one in. I don't I do not and I will not cut this case up to fit an ATX power supply. I just will not do it. That's like violation of a lot of things. <laughs> that's it's violating the sanctity and the originality of that case and it's an awesome case and I love it. So I'm not gonna do that. But um it is a big giant case and it would hold this motherboard without any problem. But the board itself um height wise is pretty much identical to an ATX so I don't think it would have a problem fitting into a standard ATX case as long as the case is wide enough to fit this sucker. This is an extended I would call it an extended ATX but it's really not an ATX it's it's like it's a bizarre format it's like an ATX but it's got an AT keyboard header and AT uh, power supply connectors which is bro broken out from a standard ATX power supply and that's what the manual actually said to do he said you had to actually special order a power supply with this thing and tell them that when they're building it that they have to convert the ATX to an AT header and still comply with the uh, ATX standard which is why you've got a separate header over here for standby and, and uh, the power switch the power on uh, switch and stuff like that to the power supply so that's it's ATX broken out into several different connectors it's strange but that's what they did so but uh, the last dual penny and pro motherboard that I had back when I first started this channel didn't have anywhere near that many expansion slots on so that's going to be nice I think this board overall is a better layout than that one was and uh, being that the processors are side by side, you know, I could maybe stretch a large penny and two heat sink across those things. It's just a matter of finding out, a, figuring out a way to mount it to the socket. I do have one thing I was testing, and it was this. This is for a um, a, a socket 939 AM, AM2, AM3, you know, an AMD clip. And I did bend this, the ends of it there, to a point where it will clip onto that uh, socket, but the little center point right here that presses down on the heat sink um, it's basically just slightly above the socket itself so there's not enough room for the, the thickness of the processor not to mention the thickness of the heat sink for this thing to clip on so I, that didn't really work out but maybe uh, maybe some clips for, for a, a Pentium 4 would work somehow I just don't know yet but, uh, yeah, this is where we're at right now. So, anyway, take care, everyone. Peace out.